Okay. Um, so, yeah, so just a little bit um, additional information about me is, um, so as we guys said, I'm an uh, entrepreneur and I'm hopefully turned social entrepreneur. So, um, so my, my na next business uh, or next um, enterprise is going to focus on, um, on uh, culture design through platforms for personal growth. Um, I specialize in machine learning. I am a published scientific author. And I'm also an avid practitioner of lateral thinking and interdisciplinary analysis. And this is um, basically the angle which I want to uh, take uh, in that talk. Uh, so I want to be, um, I want to traverse multiple domains uh, to hopefully create a more holistic understanding um, of uh, the problem of misinformation and the influence of um, kind of adversary social network interactions on society and individuals. Um, so in that talk, uh, I would like to challenge some uh, uh, in the box thinking that, pop that is popular in the subject of fake news uh, and misinformation. Um, I'd like to make a case for complex systems modes of thinking. Um, so saying that they're really important and actually quite indispensable tools uh, in the effort of uh, web immunization and in general in other effort, efforts of positive social change. Um, and um, having introduced that notion of complex systems, I would like to advertise uh, a couple of useful frameworks, both as established and bleeding edge that explore a modality, uh, this modality of complex systems for applicable understanding and design of effective interventions in complex systems. Um, then I'm going to go a little bit uh, interdisciplinary um, and introduce a modern definition of trauma uh, as a useful lens through which to view the human condition to understand behavior uh, and understand the sources of harmful behavior. Um, and in general, um, understand possible interventions that are more than firefighting, that are more uh, uh, long-term. Uh, and uh, then drawing on these, um, uh, these examples from complex systems, I would like to Kind of make a case for um, investigating the techniques employed in therapy and personal growth as possible cyber vaccine. So um, trying to convince um, uh, convince the, 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 the listener that they could possibly quite effectively reduce harm from misinformation. Um, and um, Lastly, I would like to kind of provide some inspiration of using software and AI uh, in making those treatments scalable and cost effective and um, a sketch kind of a field study that could be done within the web immunization grant or this, uh, this, this, this general endeavor that we have here uh, committed to. And just a disclaimer, I might be wrong about all of this. Uh, I'm kind of taking the liberty of the courage to be wrong. Um, but this panel is about idea generation. So I hope that's OK. And time is short and the subject is broad. Um, so the depth will be limited. Uh, so feel invited to reach out to me for additional information on the things that have been touched on during this um, um, this talk, and there are also going to be some bibliog bibliography at the end where you can actually reach to the sources that have inspired some of the thoughts in this um, in this presentation. Um, so let's start with the challenging. Let's start with being outrageous and basically uh, probably not being liked by the other panelists. Uh, <laughs> But I think it's gonna be fun. Uh, so, so I think uh, I've identified three very important um, box types uh, that are um, often inhibiting um, 
effective work with complex systems uh, and the society and the humans are complex systems. Um, and I want to give some examples for each of those. So we have uh, a focus on symptom versus cause. Um, we have a focus on pathology and firefighting. And we have reductionism where we try to really, we um, out of fear of complexity, we really limit um, the field of study to a very narrow uh, part of the system, which um, oftentimes results in uh, reduced uh, predictive capability uh, and reduced uh, quality of interventions. So uh, first focus on symptoms versus cause. Um, um, let's see on examples. Um, the first box, we're gonna talk on uh, anger. So we can, for example, create an assumption box uh, where anger in social media should be suppressed because it threatens the civil society and stability of our institutions. Um, but if we kind of go deeper and unpack anger a little more, uh, we see that this is a prim primary emotion of protecting oneself. Uh, and psychologists uh, say that there are multiple modes of anger and some of them are very healthy. Um, so anger, uh, according to jo uh, Jordan B. Pe Peterson, can be an immature reaction to an overwhelming uh, situation, but can also be a necessary reaction to tyranny. So, so a very adaptive emotion, a very important emotion. Um, so now we can have a look at uh, what kind of prison bars does this box create and we can see that by suppressing anger, we risk, risk uh, censorship or authoritarian regime where grassroots change is impossible. So we, we kind of uh, create a dystopia by trying to help and alleviate an existing problem. Uh, and how do we step outside the box? And these are going to be in this format here, usually questions that we can ask ourselves to kind of broaden our understanding of the issue. So. So, in, so we can ask, for example, how we can help ourselves to mature uh, so we are less overwhelmed, thus reducing those immature reactions, or how we can help ourselves to be aware of our anger and see the real drivers so our anger cannot be hijacked by an outside um, agency. Uh, or we can also ask what tyranny do we or the people oppose and can we find constructively uh, uh, find ways to constructively enlisting that energy of anger into meaningful change. Um, so that's anger and similarly um, distrust distrust. Um, um, and we can say, okay, there's a lot of uh, mistrust caused by social media. Um, uh, and there are all these conspiracy th theories and all those kind of misinformation uh, just circulating around. So we need to teach people to trust in the authority of science and institutions. Um, and how do we best do it, right? So that's the box. Uh, but when we unpack this trust, when we go deeper uh, into how it functions in the complex system, um, so it can be a result of a cognitive bias of unresolved developmental issues or traumatic events, and that becomes not distrust by, but mistrust. We, we just place our trust um, in, improperly um, and can be a false dichotomy wrongly generalized from experience. So kind of I have been mistreated once, everyone must be evil. Um, but can be an adaptive reaction to an entity or system that has violated us repeatedly. I don't trust this person because two times he cheated me, right? Or I don't trust this uh, institution because it has provided um, improper information on multiple occasions, right? Um, so distrust uh, is an essential component of creative and balanced cooperation. Um, so, now that we unpacked it, we can see the prison bars and we can see um, the risk of a sunken cost fallacy when propagating a falsified narrative uh, through a trusted source becomes an imperative, a kind of an end uh, in itself, 
out of the fear of compromising the, believ the believability of the source itself. So once a public agency kind of tweets um, a particular science fact that then is debunked, it might be prompt to continue this line of reasoning out of the fear of um, losing this credibility, right? This currency in the information entrepreneurship, right? And this is very dangerous. Um, we can see, you know, that leads to censorship or alienation of affected groups. Like we just push them away because they're mistrust. Uh, so, um, so we kind of close them in their, their own segment and just, just push them away, right? Um, but it can also disable the skeptics and nonconformists who are essential agents of societal evolution, right? There is, uh, you know, most of innovation comes from those who disagree with the status quo, right? Mistrust the status quo. Um, so what do we do to step outside? Um, uh, so what is the reality of people who mistrust, right? Is, this, is it generated by another non-adaptive process, right? Could it be caused by anxiety or hypervigilance that all result from, from trauma? Um, uh, how can this process be amended, this generating process, not the symptom, right? Um, what's, and also we can ask what systems have perpetually violated trust? Um, um, and how coercion has become a societal norm uh, because of marketing and kind of post-truth politics. Um, you know, mistrust may be a natural reaction to a culture of coercion, right? Um, and how those drivers can be amended and put in check so we can restore the healthy trust, right? Um, how we can educate ourselves about healthy trust and distrust um, and how we can have distributed agency, right? So these are some of the questions to step outside the box. So now we go into pathology and firefighting. Um, so an example how this kind of mod modality of thinking can cause um, and put us in the box is um, we should find uh, uh, ways to spot super trolls and super spreaders and disable them, right? So we find those who, you know, share a misinformation to, in a direct message to uh, 100,000 people, right? Or, 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 or 50 of their friends, right? But if we look deeper in the box, if we look to unpack this, it's like the super spreaders are usually a minority, uh, given the hypothesis that they follow a power law. Um, their impact, though their impact is amplified by the fact that sharing and giving positive feedback that the uh, that affects the algorithms is free in social networks. Um, so there are basically uh, uh, their activity is unbounded. Uh, it's free and thus can be easily gamed. Um, and also their impact is amplified by regular spreaders um, uh, and is affecting the unconscious uh, bystanders as well. Um, so from that modality, we can see the prison bars. Um, uh, so this can be taken to an extreme and that really results in censorship uh, where we kind of take away the freedom to, um, to share or the freedom to, um, or we just uh, silence particular groups that are not Mm, congruent with a general agenda, right? Um, but also, and this is uh, to quote Sharon Bakley, um, you know, we have this problem that science is always focused on people and conditions that are pathological, disturbed, or at best normal. Uh, and you can kind of see it in the past 30 years, uh, there have been about 46,000 scientific studies, studies on depression and an underwhelming 400 on joy. So we thus, with that mode of thinking, we, we risk regulating social networks into rigidity uh, instead of stimulating them into flourishing. We can kind of take away, like throw out the baby with the bathwater, take away the good that the social networks have brought us because we, we kind of over-regulate it. Um, and, this kind of turns into a whack-a-mole game where you know the trolls become smarter and we hunt them better and arms race and uh, lots of um, resources wasted. 
So how do we step outside the box? And um, we can ask ourselves what contributes to a digital hygiene uh, and uh, can some of the behaviors be automated or encoded into the platforms themselves, right? We can also look at people who do not spread misinformation or um, where misinformation is harmless to them. So it does not change their behavior in harmful ways uh, and look at their features and see if we can amplify them, if we can kind of educate them, right? Uh, to other people. Uh, we can uh, kind of, uh, we can also increase the stakes of the game of sharing um, uh, and make the sharers stakeholders in the effect of their sharing, right? Um, and that includes like transitive trust networks, for example. Um, and we can also indu induce limiters in the networks. So we can create scarcity um, that could possibly in, uh, inhibit mindless sharing. For example, we can have a limit of weekly shares per account, right? So these are, you know, different ways of looking at the problem from a different perspective. And then um, we have reductionism. So increased um, focus on a particular facet of a problem that kind of closes us uh, uh, off to the, to the underlying complex system that generates the problem. Um, and an example of thinking like this could be, we must focus on availability and quality of information of fact checking provided by a reputable source so that people can make more informed decisions, right? This is the box. But when we unpack it, when we look a little bit deeper on how people make decisions, um, we see that this box relies on the assumption that uh, we can overrule misinformation with better information by providing fuel, so information for system two, our rational thinking system to follow the Kahneman's logic. And um, to show you, um, this is the system two, this is according to Kahneman, we have two systems. We have intuition and instincts that take about 95% of our decisions and we have a rational thinking that take 5%, right? And also rational thinking is informed by heuristics from intuition and instinct. This is where, um, you know, the data that's being put into the rational process um, originates. Um, so we can see that our decision making on average uh, uh, is seldom rational uh, uh, as this process of rational thinking is slow, expensive, and often unpleasant and requires focus and attention. Um, and in fact, decision is, is a multifaceted problem invoking multiple systems. So we have the rational thinking, we have emotions and intuitions that are strongly tied to our biology. Uh, so our cortisol levels will change our intuition, right? Our, our oxytocin levels will change our intuition, right? And we have relations, um, uh, and, and we use empathy and social predictions in our uh, decision making. Um, so um, additionally, what we can see is, uh, um, is misinformation or false beliefs are not harmful unless they elicit suffering, unless they elicit some response that is harmful. So unless there is violence, risk behavior, self-harm or trans uh, transitory harm where you know, um, this information hurts somebody we spread it to, they're not, um, um, th they're not harmful, right? Um, and in that sense, misinformation uh, has to outcompete uh, other decision drivers in our, the way we make decisions to become um, harmful, right? So we can look at things that that make up for good decision making, like you know, values, awareness, mindfulness, right? Um, as inhibitors of bad decision making that could be caused by misinformation. It's you know, it's a it's a very fluent game between all those driving factors. Um, and also, uh, because of that, many people act contrary to their currently declared beliefs, uh, and this is, has to be understood. 
um, when we talk about the effects of uh, misinformation. So, so now we can see the prison bars. Uh, we are mistaking uh, a human for their system too, their rational ego, right? And in fact, many of contemporary social engineering hacks are designed to bypass rationality and kind of just serve the ways of emotion and re relational pressure. Um, so fighting them on ration rationality is a lost cause. Um, you know, we can, again, have this uh, sunken cost fallacy. Um, and, and also kind of thinking about, um, you know, credible sources is prone to corruption. Um, so, so we have the, we can kind of see this pre, the, these prison bars and now we can ask how to step outside. Um, so we can ask, for example, how do we foster mental postures that reduce suffering and decrease the chance on inflicting suffering onto others, regardless of the information that is currently hold uh, in, you know, in our working memory, right? Um, and how do we help ourselves achieve better emotion regulation so our emotions cannot be hijacked? Uh, and how do neuro biological um, uh, aspects of the human experience like diet, respiration, posture or hormonal profile um, become drivers of that affect emotion regulation and social behavior, right? So we can even ask maybe, you know, good diet and, and, and uh, respiration techniques are more important than media education because they can they change our hormonal profiles and thus our social behavior, right? Um, and you know, and we can we can think about how we kind of basically pro, um, promote those uh, positive regulatory behaviors um, as a way to countermeasure for uh, negative drivers. So yeah, so that's the box. That's uh, uh, and that's some ways of thinking to kind of to spring the discussion to how to sp uh, step outside. But you can also see that that outside of the box, uh, things are getting very complex, right? There are many interactions. There are many additional inquiries. There are many additional um, uh, lines of thought. So we can now ask, how do we navigate um, outside the box? Uh, and some really um, useful uh, tools in that is um, complex systems and complexity theory. Uh, and um, basically complex systems are systems that are composed of many diverse parts that are, that are highly interconnected and capable of adaptation um, and they perform some collective function. Uh, so the key features in the way we view uh, complex systems is the network perspective. Uh, so again, things highly interconnected, their feedback loops, they're non-linear. So we have butterfly effects, we have threshold effects, uh, we have disproportionality of input to output is very hard to predict uh, uh, with kind of easy causality what's going to result, right? Um, and um, uh, sorry, Mikhail, you wanted to say something? Uh, yes, I hate to do this, really, because uh, I feel that this is uh, the beginning of a fascinating uh, dialogue and discussion. But unfortunately, we have to really stick to the schedule because there are um, next panels and the schedule is very packed. And unfortunately, you have just reached your time, okay. uh, as, as I was uh, a little bit afraid of. So um, we still have five minutes. So maybe I will give back the mic to, to Isabella uh, uh, about the questions. Sure. And uh, definitely, we will schedule a much longer time to, to discuss everything that you didn't have the time to present. Uh, sure. Maybe I can jump to conclusions for two minutes. Uh, so make it please two minutes. <laughs> yeah, OK. Uh, just feel free to stop me. Um, so basically, um, we need a well-rounded approach that optimizes the mind, the embodied brain, uh, our relationships. And this approach has to be informed by complex systems. Uh, systems. 
And we need to look for uh, ways um, to create a mentally thriving society in, and it's a matter of global security. So preventative mental health care is a must. Lifelong education and practice um, is a prerequisite for happy and safe society. Um, and we can look at uh, how uh, software and AI can contribute. Um, so it can contribute in scaling those efforts and can contribute in making, um, uh, judging the progress of those efforts uh, more data-driven. Um, it will help us uh, to reverse engineer complex systems. Uh, and it's good at monitoring complex systems because it can take in a multitude of signals um, that uh, humans are, you know, have hard, uh, hardship to follow. And I want to propose an objective for weaponization is we create a field study where four groups, uh, one is unconditioned, a second is educated about misinformation and ways of reasoning. The third one is enlisted into a personal uh, and relational growth program where we kind of teach mindfulness, positive psychology, physical exercise, and group support and relational practices. And the fourth one is a combination of, two, uh, of the, 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 the second one and the third one. And we see, we kind of uh, see if the hypothesis that um, having a kind of developed uh, grown human that has the tools for, for kind of positive engagement in life is actually vaccine enough uh, to the misfits of uh, misinformation, to the, to the threats of misinformation. And that's it. Sorry.